Amen. All right, how many of you need a handout? You need the handout, okay? Keep your hands up and they will get to you with that. If you do have your handout uh, ready, go with me to Matthew chapter 6 if you would. Matthew chapter 6. Everybody got a handout? Okay, Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to ask you this uh, week if you would stand with me as we read this passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. And it says this, Therefore I, this is the Lord speaking, of course, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much, again, for being the God that you are. We're so grateful that we have you to look up to, to talk to, to lean on, to trust in. Thank you for your salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for day-by-day day needs met in our lives. And not, not just talking about things, but talking about your presence, talking about your guidance, talking about your protection, talking about your provision, spiritual provision. Father, thank you for the things you not only give to us, but the things you keep from us, things that we don't need, things that will harm us, things that we don't often see, and rarely even acknowledge. But Father, as we gather together here for this brief time, help us, Father, to put all thoughts of outside activities and things that we're, we're involved in, help us to put them aside. I pray that you take them from our minds completely and help us for this brief time to focus entirely on you. May your Holy Spirit have free reign in our thoughts and our, our mind, that your word would penetrate our very soul, and have the impact on each of us that would glorify you and also work to our benefit. For we ask all this in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. All right, go ahead and please be seated. You probably noticed on your handout that's very brief today. There's only three uh, blanks to fill in, three points. But don't be misled by that, it, it's, uh, even though it's only three points. Each one of those points is going to take probably an hour for us to go through. You, you look worried. <laughs> Worry is what we're going to be talking about today. Last week we talked about, well, well, we're in a series called You Win Some, You Lose Some, right? Uh, last week we talked about how to win peace. Today we're talking about how to lose worry. It's kind of the opposite of what we talked about last week. 
If you remember the, the verse in, in Philippians chapter uh, 4, verse 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, right? So we kind of covered some of this last week. So, but, but I want to approach it from a different angle today. How to stop worrying. How do you do that? You know, we worry a lot about stuff. We really do. I heard about this man who went to a psychiatrist. And laid on the couch and the psychiatrist said, well, tell me what's bothering you. The guy says, well, I, I just had these, these weird sensations that, that sometimes I think I'm a teepee and, and sometimes I feel like I'm a wigwam. The psychiatrist looked at him and said, I think your problem is you're too tense. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll work on him. <clears throat> But we do have a tendency to worry a lot. And point number one, let's get right into it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Like last week, the verse says, be anxious for nothing. Be careful for nothing. Depending on what version you're, you're looking at, it's worded different ways, but it means exactly the same things. Paul is saying to the people at, at Philippi, and of course the, the letter was, was copied and passed around to other churches and was read all the, the churches at that time, he was saying the same thing to all believers everywhere at all times, including now, and he's basically saying the same thing I just said, don't worry about it. Just don't do it. You know, we worry about stuff, all of us do. Now, I'm, I'm, this message, as, as is most all messages, it, it's not me talking to you. It's God talking to all of us. I say this because this message applies just as much to me as it does to anybody in this room. Don't think I don't worry about stuff. I do. I don't think I worry about stuff as much as I used to. The Lord has helped me on a lot of different things. Uh, but I still worry from time to time. Doesn't help. I was really worried last Monday night about the game. <laughs> Didn't help, did it? Didn't help. But we do worry about stuff all the time. In fact, uh, studies have shown that 40% of the things that we worry about are about things that will never happen. Thomas Jefferson said, and I'd never heard this quote until this week in preparing for this message, but Thomas Jefferson said this, how much have cost us the evils that never happened? We spend so much time worrying about things that don't happen, that never do happen. 30% of the things we worried about are things in the past that can't be changed. I, I do worry about stuff like that. Now, it seems stupid, but I, I, some of you have told me you do the same thing. I'll go home at the end of the night, and usually, you know, as I'm getting ready to drift off to sleep, I, I kind of review the things of the day. And I tend to review things I said to different people, conversations. I kind of replay them in my head. And that happens every Sunday, every Sunday night. I'll think back on the, the messages that I've spoken out, and I'll, I'll, I'll chastise myself. I'll beat myself uh, about the head and shoulders saying, why in the world did you say that? Why didn't you say this? Why did you say that that way? And this, this is not just during the messages. It's conversations with people. I replay stuff. That's stuff that happened in the past. And those things uh, you shouldn't have to worry about anymore, right? They're in the past right? But 30%, 40% of the things we worry about are things that will never happen. 30% are things about the past that can't be changed. We're up to 70% already. Another 12% of the things we worry about are things about criticism by other people, most of which is untrue. But we worry about what other people think about us. Another 10% of the things we worry about is about our health. We worry about our health a lot. And as I'll tell you in just a minute, and I'll give you some more facts and figures on this, but worrying about your health actually makes it worse most of the time. Doctors have proven, and studies have proven this. Uh, I, I, 
I can't remember how long ago they were. It's been more than a, a decade or two. But I remember when the first studies came out that showed that people who are happier get well more quickly. Solomon said it years ago, that, that, that uh, a merry heart is as medicine to the bones. So the, the better your attitude is, the more positive your attitude, the better you have, a, a better chance you have of recovering and recovering more quickly. Now, we're up to 92% of the things we worry about. Only 8% of the things we worry about are real problems that we will actually face. So 92% of the stuff we worry about, we're wasting our time. So don't worry about it. Do you know that stress affects you physically as well as mentally? It's not just a burden on your mind, but it can, it can affect you physically. And I, I had personal experience with this too, and I don't want to go on uh, off, the, off topic here, but, but uh, in, in, in reading what physical effects stress has, I found an amazing list. Some of these I have experienced, some of them I haven't, but symptoms of high stress. And here's where you might want to take notes and say, okay, he's talking about me, okay? Headaches. Do you ever get that headache right back here in your neck? Your neck gets all tensed up? Yeah. That's what I was feeling last Monday, right about halftime, okay? Yeah. Headaches. How about moodiness and irritability, often caused by stress? High blood pressure, you already knew that. Acid reflux, caused by stress. Muscle pain, especially in the neck or the back, the lower back especially. Overeating, caused by stress. Teeth grinding and jaw pain as a result of grinding your teeth, right? Insomnia, that is, you're not able to sleep at night. Or the opposite, you're sleeping too much. Those are often caused by stress. How about negative thoughts and depression? You already knew that too, caused by stress. Panic attacks, caused by stress. Um, some, some of you have experienced panic attacks. I used to experience panic attacks when, back when I was in my 30s. And I didn't know until then that it was caused by stress and I didn't realize how much stress I was under at the time until I started having those. You know, those don't, you don't have to deal with those. Uh, I haven't had any in 30, almost 35 years now. Um, you can get rid of those. There are ways to do that. Also, let's, it, it gets worse. Stress can cause diseases such as digestive issues, including irritable bowel syndrome, spastic colon, alopecia, which is hair loss, You had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> Skin rashes, like dermatitis, and shingles. Now, uh, hair loss can, can be not just what the obvious, what you're thinking of, but uh, years ago, and let me just throw this in here, because I think some of you have experienced this too. Uh, years ago, I was under such stress that patches on my face just stopped, stopped growing beards. Just, just patches. Just stopped. Didn't have to shave in this part here or this part here. Jesus was under such stress in the Garden of Gethsemane that his blood pressure went so high it actually burst the capillaries in his head and the blood oozed forth. Dr. Luke, who was a physician, wrote about this. Sp uh, stress can also exacerbate things like heart problems, diabetes, arthritis, and asthma. And the list goes on and on. If you were to go to WebMD, and some other sites, uh, Mayo Clinic, Health Site, all these different things, they list all these things that I've talked about and more that are caused by stress. We could go on and on and on, but we have other things to talk about. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not here to diagnose anybody, but these are things that can cause, be caused by stress and anxiety and worry. Things that the Lord says, let it go. Let it go, just stop. Remember I quoted uh, Frozen last week, it, it, it's very true. A man named Arthur Summers Roche said this, anxiety is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. So why do that to ourselves? Just stop it, right? 
I have a, an instructional video that I think you might uh, learn a lot from and enjoy. Watch. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, still being uh, very delighted about it. Yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And, uh, and let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And I, and I I don't make change. All right. <laughs> and go. <clears throat> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive, and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm... Uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, if, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, you're there. Stop it! I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds so, so frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop <laughs> So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. Well, it's only been it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Uh, I only have a five, so. Well, I I don't I don't make change. Then I I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew, uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! <laughs> Not of some kind. Don't don't do that. But I, I'm compelled to. My mom used to call me. No, 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 no. No, we did, we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. Just, <laughs> just stop it! What, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it! <laughs> don't be such a big baby. I wash my hands a lot. 
That's all right. Yes. I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! How, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! Stop it! You stop it! What's, what's the problem, Kathy? And you and you don't you don't like them? No, I don't. So you think we're we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want you want to get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Well, that's some good counseling right there. <laughs> Just stop it. Don't worry about it. Right? That's good advice. It really is. But what else goes along with that to help us stop worrying? That's point number two. Give it to God. Give it to God. You know, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, and I forgot to put this on the, on the outline, by the way, but in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is Jesus talking. And he's not talking about physical labor. He's not talking about carrying too heavy a load and like you're, you're lugging a refrigerator into your, your house and you need some help and you're asking him for help. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the burdens we carry on our back all the time. The burdens we carry in our mind all the time. The things we worry about all the time. Things we don't need to be worrying about. We need to give those to him. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, a yoke is something that binds uh, two oxen together to carry a load. They press against that yoke. And, and if you've got two oxen that are equal in size and strength and ability, then they will push equally on that yoke. And he's saying, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learning is a process. It's not an event. It's not something that's going to instantly happen, right? We need to learn of him. For I am meek, he says, humble and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. He's not talking about physical rest. He's talking about spiritual rest, mental rest, emotional rest, the, the rest that goes into our soul. Then he goes on to say, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My burden is light. That's an amazing statement when you consider what's behind that statement and who is saying it. This is Jesus Christ. And don't think of him like the world thinks of him, just some namby-pamby, milk-toast, uh, itinerant preacher um, like a, like a, just a quiet sissy who's walking around the countryside teaching people how to be meek and mildly and turn the other cheek. That's not the Jesus I know. The Jesus I know is God of the universe. He created everything with the power of his words. He holds everything together. The book of Colossians says, by him all things consist. He is almighty God. In human form. My burden is light? Boy, if I had the responsibility of the entire universe on my shoulders, I wouldn't feel like my burden was light, would you? I have trouble handling my own thoughts and, and life and, and things of that, that sort going on in me, and I'm only one of seven billion people on the planet, which happens to be a really dinky planet in the scope of the entire universe. And my minuscule problems are more than I can handle. And he says, my burden is light? Wow. I do have a lot to learn from him. 
So that's what we need to do. We need to give it to God. Now, don't raise your hands, but I wonder how many of you have ever been promoted to a supervisory position where you work or a managerial position where you work, maybe even risen to become boss where you work. When you first went in and, and took that job, you went in at an, at an entry-level position. And you had bosses over you and nobody under you. And maybe you did such a good job at what you were hired to do that you were, you were promoted to another position. Eventually, you had people under you, and you became a supervisor. Do you remember how stressful that became when you are now responsible for other people? I have known people who have gotten promoted to supervisory positions and the stress became so much on them, they requested to go back to their former position and not take the supervisory position with the extra pay and the extra perks, but they wanted to go back to being at the bottom where the stress was relieved. They didn't have the, the, the money they had before, didn't have the perks and position they had before, but the stress was off of them and their lives were much happier and they were healthier because they no longer had that stress. Can you imagine that being the case? I've known people who've turned down supervisory positions for that same reason, as well as the ones who went back to their former position. Now, with that in mind, let me ask you a question. Who's the supervisor here? He is, right? Does he serve us or do we serve him? Who is over who here? He is Lord, isn't he? Isn't Jesus Lord? Isn't he the one who's supposed to worry about us? What we are doing when we take on the worries and the burdens, we are usurping his authority. We are putting ourselves in his position. We are essentially acting as if we were the ones in charge and everything depends on us and not on him. We need to demote ourselves and go back to a servant's position and let him do the supervising. Wouldn't you agree? He needs to be the one who handles those things. He is our supervisor. Serving should not be stressful. Supervising is stressful. Supervising should be stress-free. Uh, serving should be stress-free. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. You know the story. This is where uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the, the whole Babylonian empire, he uh, builds a statue. And he requires everyone to worship that statue. When the music begins to play, everybody is supposed to bow and worship the statue. But the enemies of the Israelites who came into captivity, three in particular, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what they, they were known by in their Babylonian names. Um, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and uh, Azariah, I think, were their original names. They um, refused to bow. And their enemies reported them to the Babylonian authorities. So they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, who gave them another opportunity. He had a basically kind spirit. He had a dark side to him too, but he had basically kind spirit, gave them an opportunity and said, okay, you're going to hear some music in just a few minutes. When you hear the music, you're going to bow to that statue. If you do that, everything's good. If you don't do that, then I want you to know that this same hour, you're going to be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who can deliver you from my hands? And at that point, they said in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Now, I want to explain that word. We are not careful. They don't mean they're being careless. They are using that word in the exact same way that Paul used it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when he says, be careful for nothing. He said, they are saying, we're not full of care about this. We're not worried about this. We're not anxious about this. We're not stressed in answering you about this matter. 
They said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, that is, if God allows us to die right here, right now, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine a more stressful situation than being brought before the emperor and threatened with my life. If you recant your faith, essentially is what he's saying to them. If you will bow to my statue, worship my gods, then you will live. If you do not do that, you will die. What's your decision? What's your final answer? And they weren't worried at all. They said, we're not stressed. We're not worried. We are not full of care in answering you about this matter. King, we're not going to do it. We're just not going to do it. We're going to serve our God to the death. If that death happens today, if it happens 20 years from now, it doesn't matter to us. Either way, God is glorified. We are not going to do it. They gave it to God. They put it in God's hands. We're going to serve the Lord, is basically what they said, and if the Lord allows us to die, that's his will. If he doesn't allow us to die, that's his will. Either way, we're good with God. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Now it came to pass as they went, that's the Lord and his disciples, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care? Don't you care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. What's going on is Jesus and his disciples came over for dinner. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. And then him? That's thirteen, right? Now, if thirteen people came over to your house for dinner, and remember, there was no texting, there was no cell phone, they couldn't call in advance and say, hey, we're coming over for dinner tonight. They just showed up. And she's got to make dinner for herself, her sister, her brother, Lazarus, and 13 guests. Remember, there's no refrigerator. They have to go to the market and get all the stuff right away, right? Now, would you be stressed? Uh, depends. I think most of you would be stressed if one person came over and you hadn't had a chance to clean the house thoroughly, right? <laughs> right? 13 people for dinner, no chance to prepare. Sure, she was stressed. She was going all around the house. She's trying to dust and clean and clean the bathroom and, and fix the kitchen up and, and make sure that the, the, the brown serve rolls came out of the oven at the same time the, the mashed potatoes and gravy did. You know how that works, you know, and, and doing all this stuff. And, and Mary is just sitting in the living room on the floor at Jesus' feet listening to him talk. And, and as this is going on, she's getting madder and madder and madder. And finally she goes in and says, Jesus, don't you care that I'm doing all this work and she's just sitting here, make her do something. You know what she's really saying? She said, Jesus, why don't you make her worry as much as I'm worrying? Why don't you make her stress as much as I'm stressing? Why do I have to be the only one worried here? Now, have you ever been surrounded by other people? who are upset with you sometimes when you don't worry about stuff as much as they do? And they want you to worry like they do? Yeah. We are surrounded by people who want to bring us down spiritually in all different ways. This is one thing we don't talk about a whole lot, but this is one thing that people do with us as well, to try and take our focus off of Jesus and onto the things of the world. I want you to worry about this as much as I worry about this. This thing's going on over here. This thing's going on over here. Don't you care? That's what's going on. So are you a Martha or are you a Mary? Don't put your hand up. Don't do this. 
What's the Lord saying to you? Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Wow. Martha was investing her time wisely. She was getting closer to Jesus and wanting to be more like Jesus. Don't you want to be more like Jesus? My burden is light, he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, he says. Yeah, we need to be more like Jesus. Now let's go to point number three. Practical steps to reduce anxiety. Practical steps to reduce anxiety. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not tr trying to play psychiatrist. I'm not, not trying to give you pop psychology here. But there are some very practical things that we can do. As a church, as Christians, we need to minister to the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, right? That's what we're talking about here. Here are some things you can do very practically to reduce your anxiety. Number one, and I don't have a listing of these. You'll just have to write them down in the space provided. Learn your triggers. What triggers your anxiety? What things happen in your life that really get you stressed out? Ohio State against Michigan. The Yankees against the Red Sox. Yeah. I'm having a little fun with you. But the, your triggers are not going to be the same as my triggers or someone else's triggers. What things trigger you? I'll give you a couple of mine. One of the things that triggers my anxiety is reading the newspaper and watching cable news. When, those, when I understand that those things trigger my anxiety, I, I don't pull that trigger. You know, I eliminate that. I mentioned last week, I, I, I think it was last week, I canceled my newspaper subscription. I don't watch cable news. Well, once in a while, I will. If there's something important on and I want to watch media. Well, I was going to say breaking news coverage, but they, breaking news happens every five minutes, you know? It doesn't mean what it used to mean. But, uh, but if there's a major event, I'll watch cable news. You know, I'll watch something like that. But I, I don't have it tuned in all the time. I don't watch it all the time like I used to because it triggers my anxiety. I don't need that. Why do that to myself? There are other things that trigger anxiety in me. I'm not going to go into all that stuff. It's not my life story today. But, but you have triggers. I have triggers. We all have triggers. All God's children got triggers, right? <laughs> and so we need to understand what those are, identify them, and try to avoid them if possible. Two, we need to learn to say no. Learn to say no. Don't try to please everyone. Don't overschedule yourself. Years and years ago, many, many years ago, I had a friend who, who confronted me on this because I was trying to just please everybody and do everything everybody said, and it was really, really stressing me out. I didn't realize how much. And the other problem was that I was promising this person that, I was promising this person that, promising this person that, and I was letting a lot of people down because I couldn't possibly keep every, every commitment that I had, that I was making. Uh, and, and still sometimes I... I maybe double book myself in something. I'll make an appointment here, make an appointment there, and they're the same appointment. Or, so now I just let Tammy handle that. I let her schedule me because she, she keeps track of that. Reduces stress a whole lot. Uh, but learn to say no. If, you, if you're overscheduled, if you're overstressed, and you can't do all the things you'd like to do, we need to learn to prioritize and say no to some things. Uh, years ago, I went to a conference on uh, stress, how to reduce stress. Uh, it, was, it was actually provided by my employer. I went to another town and, and went in this, this one-day conference. And one of the best things that they taught me was to list all the things that you need to do for that day and prioritize them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And don't try to do all the things on your list. Because every one of us has more stuff to do every day than we can possibly do. There are only so many hours in a day. 
And they, say, they said, okay, if you just get the top three things done on your list, you've done good. And then just start over with another list the next day. Take number four, move that up to number one, or something else may crop up and, and go ahead of this. And, the, and then the question came up, well, what if my boss, because this was a work-related seminar, what if my boss gives me something else to do when I've already got this priority list? They said, well, go to your boss and say, okay, these are the things that I have to do. These are things that you've already given me to do. Where do you want this new task to go in on the priority list? Let them prioritize it. Do you want this ahead of this? Or you want, is this, can I put this on the back burner? And then just do what you can do. Boy, that made a huge difference. Huge difference. So learn to say no. Third, learn to live one day at a time. Matthew 6.34, we read it just a little while ago in our, in our opening text. Take, therefore, just a little bit of thought for the morrow. Some thought for the morrow. Say it again. No thought. It says no thought. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow. Why? For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James says, don't say that you're going to go into the city this day and that day and we're going to just do whatever we need to do. Say, if the Lord wills, we're going to do this or that or the other thing. Because none of us knows if we're going to be alive tomorrow. Why worry about tomorrow? Right? Right? Take no thought for the morrow. Four, schedule downtime for yourself. Schedule downtime for yourself. After coming home at the end of the day, if you've got, a, especially if you've got a really stressful job, you need some downtime at home. Take an hour, take half hour, take an hour and a half, whatever you need to just just unwind. And just take your mind off the things that you've uh, been thinking about all day, the things you've been worried about all day, the projects you're involved in. Take some downtime for yourself. You need to swap up the things that you do. Uh, I do this uh, when, I, when I'm writing, for example. Um, mo most of you know I, I do some writing. And so if I'm in my office, uh, uh, my upstairs at it, 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 home, I've got an office, and I'll, I'll do some writing. I was doing this yesterday, last night. Uh, writing, and then after you get to a point, because writing can be stressful, uh, and, and as, you, as you write, and you get to a point where, well, know, what do I do next, you know? Um, you have to just break away from it, and you come back and look at it with fresh eyes. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll write for a little bit, and I'll swap over, and I'll play a game of chess against somebody on the other side of the world. Uh, and then I'll come back and, and then do some more writing, and then I'll break and do something else. Uh, you have to do that. And I do that kind of frequently. I interact back and forth frequently. But you can't do that sometimes when you're at work. You, you, you have to come home and have some downtime at work, I mean at home, so you can get your mind away from work. Five, physical exercise. Just going for a walk somewhere reduces stress. All kinds of studies have shown that physical exercise reduces stress. Six, Get good sleep, maybe seven, eight hours a night. And, what I, what, and I put good sleep in there because it's not just sleep, because some sleep can be fitful, you know, waking up all the time. Um, you, you need to sleep well, and that means you need to have some unwinding before you go to bed so you don't go to bed when you're stressful. Uh, you, you turn off the TV or the radio sometime before you go to bed. Uh, for example, if, if, if you're watching a, a slasher movie or cable news right before you go to bed, you, you're, that's going to be on your mind. How, how can you sleep at night with, with all the worries and cares of all the things that are going on in the world around you? How can anybody do that, right? So you have to turn the TV off before you go to sleep uh, and, and unwind and don't have lights on, sound on. And just try to just get away and go to sleep. Sometimes it's hard to tune out the sound when you're sleeping. Some of you are able to do that here. 
but, but it, hopefully the sleep is not that deep, right? So, but, but you need good sleep. And then uh, next, build a support group. You need to have Christian friends and family for fellowship and fun, for counsel, people you can bounce things off of, think, people you can, you can just hang with, and, and that helps reduce your stress level as well. You can't just be alone all the time. No man is an island unto himself. Lastly, develop a habit of personal devotions. Every day, prayer and Bible study. Pick up one of those Bible reading plans if you haven't already done so and start one of those today if you haven't already done so. You need to be in the book. One of the things that works really well for me is uh, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is that's when I do my devotion. And I'm doing one of the devotions that uh, I, I use you version as my devotional guide, and I'm going through one. I, I read six different portions of Scripture uh, every night, um, and that'll get me through the whole Bible in a year. And that calms my mind. It gets my mind on the Lord and on His Word, and it, it just it helps my sleep. It just helps, helps that a lot and reduces the stress and anxiety level as well. We don't have to do all the worrying that we do. I don't think it glorifies God when we worry like we do. Let me give you one final illustration. Years ago, 1836, uh, as a matter of fact, a man named George Mueller and his wife started an orphanage in Bristol, England. 1836. They started, um, he, he felt like he was, he was led to, to minister to uh, orphans, there in Bristol. They started an orphanage. They also built a home. And in their home, their home was large enough to bring in 20 uh, girls, uh, orphan girls. And then he built this home as well uh, to bring other orphans in, the boys. And then he ended up building other homes as well. I believe six, six of them at one time they were building. And what was interesting about George Mueller, and if, you've ever, if you haven't read his biography, I encourage you to do so, he did not believe in asking anybody for money. Never. He never let it be known that he needed money for these orphanages, either to build them or to run them. And if I'm not mistaken, it took, and remember it's 1836, 200,000 pounds, the money, um, to, to build these orphanages, and he did it all by faith, all of it. Let me just read you part of the entry from his Wikipedia biography. Mueller never made requests for financial support, nor did he go into debt, even though the, these homes cost a lot of money to build. Many times he received unsolicited food donations only hours before they were needed to feed the children, further strengthening his faith in God. Mueller was in constant prayer that God touched the hearts of donors to make provisions for the orphans. In other words, he didn't go to people and ask for money. He went to God and asked for, for money and, and for, for him to provide it through people. For example, on one well-documented occasion, thanks was given for breakfast when all the children were sitting at the table, even though there was nothing to eat in the house. As they finished praying, the baker knocked on the door with sufficient fresh bread to feed everyone, and the milkman gave them plenty of fresh milk because his cart broke down in front of the orphanage. In his autobiographical, autobiographical entry for February 12th, 1842, six years after he built this place, he wrote, a brother in the Lord came to me this morning and after a few minutes of conversation gave me 2,000 pounds for furnishing the new orphan house. Now I am able to meet all of the expenses. In all probability, I will even have several hundred pounds more than I need. The Lord not only gives as much as it is absolutely necessary for his work, but he gives abundantly. This blessing filled me with inexplicable delight. He had given me the full answer to my thousands of prayers during the past 1,195 days. And this is a quote from George Mueller. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. What are you worried about? God's in control. Do you believe that? Don't just say it. Do you really believe that God is in control? If we do, 
Don't worry about it. Stop it. <laughs> or I'll bury you alive in a box. <laughs> Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard here today. I don't know what the Lord's talking to you about. I have no idea. The Lord sp speaks to each of us in different ways. But if he's talking to you about not worrying, just come up here and give it to God. Take all your worries, bring them with you, put them right here on the altar, and give them to God. And when you get up and walk away, leave them there. What is it you're worried about? If you're worried about whether you're going to be in heaven, that's something you don't need to worry about either. You can come and bring that to God. Give your sin, your soul to God. Put it on the altar. Trust him for salvation. He has made a plan of forgiveness, of redemption for you because he wants to take care of your sin and your soul. He wants you to be saved. It's not something you are designed to worry about. You need to give it to him and trust him as your savior. If you've never done that, today is a great day to do that. He died on the cross for your sin. He was buried for you. He rose for you. He did all the work. He did all the worry. You don't have to do any of it. Father, may your will be done in each of our lives, especially in this next few minutes. May our actions and responses honor and glorify you, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. Here comes we sing.
be seated for just a couple of minutes. Brother Irwin, you have an announcement? Yep. Uh, for the uh, Daniel plan, the biggest user, uh, we're going to do our weigh-in uh, right in the kitchen. So if you haven't seen, seen me yet for the weigh-in, it's going to be right in the kitchen. Start over on that because your mic wasn't on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for those who are participating in the Daniel plan, the biggest loser, uh, we're going to do our weigh-in in, in the kitchen. So is it appropriate. Is it too late? Yes. Is it too late to join? It's, um, you can, if you, uh, if you still are interested in uh, wanting to do the plan with us, you can. Just see me and uh, see my wife, Allie, and um, we'll be glad to put you in there and get you um, acquainted with a couple of accountability partners that will be, uh, be able to assist. Um, the only thing is, though, you're going to be a week behind because uh, they're already starting. They've already started uh, a week ago. But we can, we can fit you right in. Absolutely. All right. I encourage you to, be, to, to take part in that. Also, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, we will be having our annual business meeting. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. This is a, a time when you get a chance to, to find out anything you need to know about the Crossroads Baptist Church. We'll go over the uh, budget for this coming year. Um, that's always uh, a major focus of the business meeting. We're going to be asking, presenting that to you and asking your approval on that. We will also be presenting a slate of officers to you and asking your approval on that. And it's also a time when you can ask any question you like about anything. Uh, I, I always look forward to our business meetings. Uh, it's really unusual among pastors, quite frankly. Uh, a lot of pastors uh, dread business meetings because a lot of sometimes they can cause problems. But ours never do. Uh, our folks have always been in unanimous agreement on our business meetings. We have a wonderful spirit. And we encourage you to ask any question about anything uh, because nothing is hidden. Everything is, is put right on the table. And um, if we don't share information that, that, uh, that you want to know, ask us and we'll talk about it. Okay, so that's two weeks from today. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. Also tonight at 6 o'clock, we will have 202020, so plan to come back for that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing. Brother, I'm sorry? Deacon's meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Deacons meeting tonight at 5, what did we say, 5.15? 5.15 tonight. Deacons meeting 5.15 tonight. And we'll be going over the budget tonight as well. Thank you for reminding me of that. Can you come up and close us in prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this day. We thank you for Pastor Paul and his knowledge of your word. Lord, we just thank you for using him in a special way to touch our hearts and to cause us to grow and mature as Christians. Father, we just uh, thank you for each person that's in their place here today, and we ask you to protect us as we go on the highways that are a little slippery, and Lord, we just ask you to bring us back safely at the next appointed time. We'll give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.